Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are photographer Wayne Shimabukuro and performer, actress Barbara Van Orden. Photographer Wayne Shimabukuro was born and raised in Los Angeles. He's a second generation Angelino. And during high school, he attended the Junior Arts Center at Barnesdale Park and uh, the Otis College Summer Schools. He attended UC Santa Cruz and took uh, undergraduate courses at UCLA. It seems that you always wanted to be a photographer because you were in the arts. And uh, tell us about your high school teacher. Was she a big influence on you? Oh, she was, yeah, very much so. Priscilla Beatty. She, <laughs> did, did you ever know her? No, she, tell she me taught, about her. Um, Adrian Sachs and uh, Chaz uh, Bohorkas. Yeah. And uh, she uh, was a terrible artist, but a real <laughs> enthusiast. <laughs> you know? And uh, she was a great uh, sort of cheerleader for uh, students she liked. And also, she's the one oh. that turned us on to all the programs like the Otis Summer Program. Oh. And, uh, so she was sending you there in high school. Yeah. Like teenagers, you were doing this. Right, so for the you, summer programs. Did you know you wanted to be a photographer? No, I did a lot of ceramics in oh, high school. Oh, you did? Yeah. Did you have a, a kiln and everything at the high school, or did you have to Yeah, we had a complete uh, uh, ceramics lab, at co complete photo lab, too. I did take photography in high school, but... What was school more, was that? Uh, Franklin, in Highland Park. I see. Yeah. So, so do they still have those setups in high schools? I understand they've cut way back. So then, how did photography unfold in your life? Um, from ceramics. Did you actually start as a ceramist? In, no, in high school. Oh, uh, just in high school. That was, um, I enjoyed it a lot. I took a lot of other art courses as well. But at UCLA, I was in the studio program. Um, and at that time, there was a lot of influence of multimedia. So there I took a lot of classes with Peter Gould. He taught video. Really? Yeah. Peter Gould the uh, director at, at of Louvre. L.A. Louvre? Right. I didn't know he was a video person. Well, he was uh, also a real inspiration. Ah. You know, because of... So were you going to go into video or...? No, no, no. It was, you know, uh, more kind of multimedia as a, oh, oh, you oh, know, oh. in the studio art uh, field or the visual art field, not in the commercial world. So how then did the camera come about? <laughs> well, my, actually, initially my love uh, was painting. Oh dear, we're back to, oh, well, and, totally the arts, right? Right, so, uh, but I kind of got, uh, um, not distracted, but involved in multimedia. There were a lot of um, um, conceptual art uh, classes that I got involved with and really enjoyed, so I didn't really pursue the painting too much. And then after uh, I um, uh, finished my uh, undergraduate program, I just kind of bummed around, worked in art departments, and uh, that's when I picked up the camera. And then what happened when you picked it up? Because you've been photographing for, what, 30 years, 25 oh, yeah. years? Yeah, well, since I was at UCLA, uh, uh, let's see, um, uh, Heineken taught uh, photography there. Oh, he went on to be a curator? Did he, was he a curator? No, that I don't know. Did, you know, he's very well regarded and he had a particular style. And, and what style is that? How do you teach a photo, uh, to have a photo have style? Because that's one of the things I wanted to ask you. Well, basically, uh, it's TAs taught the classes. And at that point, as I say, things were very experimental. So you could really just come in with any idea that you had and go with it. And what were those? Was it lighting? Was it uh, developing your film? Because you were using film then. Film, and then uh, also some s students were just taking, uh, you know, rareographs and, uh, oh. or even just taking a projector and uh, putting themselves in the projector so you got these shadows across the wall. So just about 
you could take it in any direction that you wanted to take it in. But I was kind of interested at that point in shooting through the lens mm -hmm. so that you composed and the final image would be pretty much what you um, captured in the camera. And you could do that. Yeah, you, you could do that just precisely yeah. without developing it a certain way or cropping it or... Well, no, cropping was out. Cropping was out? No <laughs> cropping? Why was that? Well, it was a very sort of strict uh, uh, way of looking at photography that was, um, uh, you know, a lot of the um, street photographers used that um, uh, approach. And so that was the uh, approach that I kind of uh, was um, appealed to me. But also, since I was a, a painting student, um, my approach to that, could, I could go in all different kinds of ways. So later on, once the computer um, entered my vocabulary, or you know, as a tool, then I went back and just started to let, to, to let the image dictate uh, the well, final piece rather than uh, you know, the, uh, what, the frame the of the frame. camera. Well, that's, is, is it, was it easier then or was it easier now? Do you just use digital you, or do you use film still? Well, I have a, a Hasselblad that I just love. So I still shoot black and white film with my Hasselblad. And do you have you develop it yourself? No. Oh, um, you don't. You have some somebody still develops film. Yeah. Every uh, and then what I do though, interestingly enough, is I'll take my black and white negatives and scan them, oh. and then I'll print them. Mm. Um, oh, so you're printing digitally. yourself? Yeah. I see. On I the high-end uh, twelve-color um, digital printers. Is it easier then or now? Or was it easier then than now? <laughs> it, it's diff I was a terrible printer, uh, in, a darkroom printer, so I could spend the entire day in the darkroom and not really be satisfied. Well, why? What, what happened? It's a technique that I you know, was just terrible with. But, but what technique do you need? Everyone just thinks, oh, you just put the film in, put, the, put those chemicals on it, right? And it turns um, out. It, it's a craft, you know. Uh, so there are certain people I, you know, can bake, for example. I, you know, I couldn't bake anything. But... Oh, right. I can't bake either. Right. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but you... I could cook. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> but is that the idea? It, it really certain... is a, a technique. And uh, some people really have a, a talent for it. So I would find really good printers. So when you went out to actually come into the world of art photography, I guess uh -huh. you would say you were an art photographer, uh, and not a commercial, right? Right. Did you do any commercial work? I did a little, but... Um, did you need an agent to do that? Uh, for a while I was with... Uh, uh, I did some journalistic photography, uh, shooting celebrities and things like that with Visage and... Uh, oh, Gamma and then they Aizal. placed... Uh, they right. would give you the... Um, uh, um, assignment or they would place your work? Right. Mm -hmm. They would set up the shoot and then they would distribute the uh, material. So that was that was the agent of sorts mm -hmm. and you didn't uh, stick with that kind of work? Oh, I did it for quite a while but then that whole system kind of imploded. Yeah, what happened there? Um, the um, It just got much more um, controlled by the agents themselves the publicists and the actors themselves. Oh, they started getting um, uh, approval? The actors got uh, more approval? More than approval, the they started dictating. The, Is that right? So stock photography, at least that um, um, type of stock photography kind of shut down. <clears throat> Interesting, because that's what I worked with at interview a lot of. And we oh, with stock just, photography? I thought no, no, no. Oh. We would just send the photographer out let right. him do you what would, he wanted, and mm -hmm. we were happy to get the uh, artistic feeling of what the photographer like you would do. Right, but you, at interview, um, uh, gave the assignment directly to the photographer. Yes, right. we did. Right. So we were just happy to get... So when you were art directing it by choosing a particular photographer. I see, yeah. I see too. Right. When you uh, um, first started, what kind of camera? You mentioned a Hasselblad you still use now. What yeah. did you use when you first started? Uh, my first camera was a Nikon F2. And that's when I... Was that that automatic? No. no you know, it's just a 35mm manually yeah. operated... Yeah. You know, oh yeah, manually. <laughs> I remember. And you could put a motor drive on it in those days if you need, needed. Oh, that did, did right. do like so that. So I, I had a motor drive. And then did you do studio photography or did you do on uh, location? Well, for um, 
The Artist Portrait Series, it's exclusively uh, on location at the artist studio. And when you do that, do you take uh, lights with you and assistants and all that? What do you do if you go, like, this catalog that you, you have side by side um, has a lot of uh, photographs of artists. And it's a fantastic uh, idea, like, like Grant Mudford's, mm -hmm. the Disney Hall, because that's a photo, photo he took. Right. And... Um, but did you use lights or did you use natural light or how did you go about that? Uh, I did both. I always brought a set of lights with me and um, I tried not to use them. I tried to use available light uh, whenever possible. But in some instances, like in a dark studio when I shot Larry Bell, I absolutely needed to use the studio lights. We've talked about uh, some of the artists, and you have chronicled the art world. How did you get to these artists? They're mostly local artists, I would say. Yeah, it's pretty much based on LA. And how did you get to them? Well, it was originally through UCLA. A lot of them were fellow students and teachers. Oh. Like Michael McMillan was a TA of mine when I was an undergraduate. And you photographed him. And I photographed Michael. And then, um, so, all of my contacts as a student were, were other artists, and that's how I got started. Oh, so you're just one friend after another. Right. Uh, some of the stories, I know we've talked about it, I think are really interesting. The Chris, uh, Bac uh, Don Bacardi and Christopher Isherwood uh, that you photographed. You went into their home. Yes, well, I had um, met them about when I was in college, and so knew them. Uh, uh, as friends and um, so they were some of my early experiments and they were so good at just saying yes whenever I wanted to photograph them that I photographed them quite often over the years. Oh so you just kept going back? Yes yeah, so I have a huge portfolio of photographs of the two That's of them. fantastic and I, Nick Wilder was a great early um, gallery dealer here. Yes. And he and Don Bacardi drew him yeah, uh, that uh, uh, drawing I just shot, saw at his show at Michael's was so beautiful. And, but you photographed Nick, too. I did. Uh, I, actually, the best photograph I have of Nick was when he moved to New York and became an artist himself. Oh, isn't that funny? Henry Hopkins, who was also a curator, uh -huh. became an artist as well. David Hockney? Uh, David, I also... Uh, was one of the, uh, let's say, first well-known professional artists that I photographed. I photographed him working on Mulholland Drive in 1980. Oh, when he did that painting, yeah, right. so it was I fantastic. A huge, uh, well, a fairly large portfolio of him at work on that painting. That's great. That's owned by the LA County, I right, think, right? right? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And we have to leave, but tell us a little okay. story about Moses and Chaz Garabedian, well, Ed Moses. <laughs> I like and admire them both very much, and uh, their work is so different from each other, but uh, you know, to me, they represent two uh, styles uh, in LA art that are uh, uh, really different, but uh, I think are very important. So I tried to get the two of them together, and uh, they both were amenable to it, so I photographed them a couple of times, but uh, Ed is so scattered. <laughs> <laughs> to get him to uh, settle down, so that I could kind of compose a shot of the two of them, oh. which was impossible. <laughs> Absolutely. Impossible. So uh, with the Hasselblad, I just was, you know, I had to put it on a tripod and sort oh, of yeah. uh, compose. It was an utter failure. <laughs> but with my handheld camera, I got a lot of nice incidental shots of the two of them separately that they both liked. Oh, I see. But never together. Not a really good shot. So. You know, I want to do something like this. But yeah, no way, no huh? Way. <laughs> this is Don and... Uh, John Sansini. Yeah, right. that's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much, Wayne. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for watching this part of the show. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Actress, fashion maven, performer, Barbara Van Orden. Barbara is currently involved in a cabaret theater show, which she's written, produced, 
And as a performing person, she's the center of everything, right, Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> but let's start with your career in fashion. You were at Bonwitz, you were at Vogue, you were modeling, and you were designing. Yes. Let's go through that. Well, I started off as the Breck girl, the Breck <gasps> hair commercials. That beautiful yes. hair? Long hair. <laughs> it used to be thicker, even, believe it or not. And it was real, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Because now they add make fake oh, hair. Well, then you couldn't do that. My goodness, <laughs> that, that was definitely out. But, and there, uh, I, you know, was in fashion, of course, when you, you do that, you do a lot of print work, you do a lot of commercials. And um, I was also um, a buyer at Bond with Teller in between. And one day we did a Vogue um, magazine, uh, they did a, a spread on some of the clothes uh, from Bonwit. And what happened was, he said to me, he said, why are you behind the camera? Why are you not in front? <laughs> and I said, well, I do some commercials and I've done a little this or that, but you know. Anyway, that started the career. And, but I was also a singer and I broke in the Catskill Mountains in New York. So you, so you modeled. I modeled. And then you went into entertainment. Or was it simultaneous? At the same time. You know, it was. When, when you're walking around New York with your big portfolio, you know, because you're going for commercials, you're going for print work, you're going for, to see if you're going to get a part in a play, if you're going to be in a musical, whatever you, whatever you could do, you know, in the beginning years like that. Oh, you were. So, yeah, and I was exposed to a lot of different things or different people. And then they would see me and they'd say, well, will you do this? or would you do that and then I had an agent you know but coming out of Emerson is that how you plan to have your life well uh, not really I really <laughs> I, things are always when I was asked to be the Breck girl at 16 years old wow but of course they fired me at 18 because I was too old Entirely too old at 18 years old. <laughs> Can you believe it? Thank God you were 16. But, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't have gotten the role. <laughs> oh, but I'll tell you, in those years when you had dark hair, you didn't work because you were ethnic. Oh, uh -huh. you were you were a dark-haired Breck lady? No, I was a, a red, like a, a Irish setter dog Oh, you were color. a yeah. yeah. In fact, I carried, I had, I saw an Irish setter dog walking down the street where I, my home, and I asked the man, could I have a piece of his tail? because I knew I needed that color. So when I went to the hairdressers all the time, I'd say, here, this color, this is not maroon, not orange, this. So it was and your Breck color. It was my that was your Breck color? Oh, yes, yes, because dark haired, <laughs> and I'm not ethnic, I'm English, Irish, Welsh, and I mean, I'm here for generations. And, uh, but anyway, but now, of course, as you know, it's different. But then you were a blonde or you were light haired. I know. That's what it was. I wasn't even thinking of that. When you yeah. said Breck girl, I thought blonde. No, no, no. Well, my whole family are blondes and redheads, and I was the only dark haired one. But with beautiful blue eyes. Thank you. How Thank lucky. You. Thank you. How lucky, how lucky. So you're you're trying to get on the stage and you're getting modeling oh, yeah. jobs and, and so you I'm started gonna, entertaining and singing and singing. Yeah, and all of a sudden, at the time, at the uh, the Catskill Mountains, High Horn, High Einhorn, and uh, Charlie Rapp were the big bookers of the mountains, and they came and <laughs> bookers they, of the mountains. Yes, the Catskills <laughs> uh, owned the Nevely. I mean, Rose Singers. I mean, you got <laughs> Browns. I mean, all of them was wonderful places. And uh, they uh, so anyway, they saw me uh, uh, one of my Breck commercials, and they uh, they said, "Do you sing?" And of course, my mother and father were professionals for many years. My father was in show business. He was an acrobatic tap dancer in vaudeville. And then he went on to play with the big bands, Tommy Dorsey and, and Benny Goodman. You mean play an instrument? And he played, yeah, clarinet and tenor sax. Oh, clarinet, and, yeah, <laughs> not an instrument. Yeah, right. And my mother was a beautiful blue-eyed blonde cafe society singer. Oh, fabulous. And, I wondered if you had a showbiz background. Oh, my goodness, yes. In fact, it was wonderful. My sister and I growing up, we would be, you know, upstairs in bed, time to go to bed, and people would come by to see my parents, and they'd be jamming in the kitchen with their horns. Dave Brubeck, Red Nichols, I mean, the names went on and on. Uh, so and it was wonderful. It was a, a, just priceless, priceless. So it was normal for It was you. normal for me to hear <laughs> right. me to be in that type of thing. Yes. And to be with those yes. people. Ex yes, except my mother, who was very proper, 
who was from the school of there'll be none of this and none of that, very proper, she didn't want me to go in show business. Oh, so, even though she was there. Even, well, maybe that's why. Do not follow me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but she must have loved fashion. That must have oh, been great. Oh, she loved fashion, sure, yeah. absolutely. And that she liked, and I was in that, and I had my own clothing line for a while. I know, you yeah. were a designer. Yes. I was asking about that, yes, too. Yes, would tell her about my clothing. It was Van Orden for the executive woman. So you were suits. doing suits at the time. Women weren't really yeah. wearing suits at that time. They were time. just starting. Yeah. The business, well, they're just starting to get into that. Yeah. And that and dresses, you know, that would be uh, appropriate for, for the office. whatever they need as the office. For the office. And, yeah, and that was my connection with Bonwood Teller. And uh, in fact, the Vogue was doing a few shoots, uh, layouts of some of the clothing, but some of it was mine. And that's really why oh, that's you know, how I was there. Did you, wear, did you design your own clothes? Like, say, when you were at the Playboy Club and when you were at the Catskills, yes. you did yes. design your clothes? because... <laughs> How many times do we go to the store? We love the dress, the color's wrong. We love the dress, the sleeve is wrong. But all kinds of things. So I started designing because I had the, you know, the, the, the where to to do it. And yes, all my gowns and everything else. It was just so much easier. And of course, I, I was five feet eight at 16 years old, five feet eight and very developed. I and, mean, yeah. yeah, very, you know, very small waist, but perfect figure, large, but, you, but probably hard to... Fit and on a large top, and in fact, my, my, my father said to my mother one day, oh my God, Mary, what are we going to do? My God, <laughs> look at her, she's 13 years old, she looks 20 in her build, my God. But, uh, so that's one of the reasons why I yeah, large top and a very small waist and a very small bottom and all of that. I think that's one of the things we're hearing in you right now is that comedian coming out. And you did it, you did yeah. that on stage, Well, I was you? a straight singer for so long, meaning just get up. It was at the time when we all undulated out in our black satin evening gowns. Oh, and you just sang? Sang our songs, the ballad, and they're just gracefully left. But, but, but are you? But I did do that. Yeah. But it, I was getting bored doing that. And one night when I was working with, uh, with somebody, uh, in fact, it was uh, uh, Maury Amsterdam, I said, you know, I'm bored. I'm tired of doing just this. <laughs> I, I said, you know what? I think I'd like to write some, some uh, fun stuff to do, play with the audience. And, and he said to me, go ahead. Because so he I, did that, yeah, didn't he? So I took a year off, and then I wrote an act, first time up, and I said, he said, kid, you can open for me, you can open for me. I said, great, this is the Playboy Club. Sir. So I opened for him the first time. It took me a year to write material I never wrote in my life. I never performed it in my life. Anyway, and I got the biggest laughs from then I was hooked. So really what it is, is it's a cabaret show that I'm doing. And that's what you're doing now. Yeah. So th that was kind of a lead in yes. to what you're doing now. But I, yes, I did it for so many years. But everything you did is all together in this play now, in this cabaret show. Oh, yes, show. yes. Well, I worked Vegas, too. You know, after the Catskills, I did all the Playboy clubs. And from there, I worked Vegas. I worked with Frank Sinatra. I worked with, oh, Milton Berle. Milton Berle was a big help to it, me. It just reminded me, because I think I met you with Milton Berle. Could have been. Because yes, the Friars. I, yes, because <laughs> I remember that. I remember you so well. And, and I kept trying to remember what celebrity it was. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. Maury Amsterdam, no, it was Milton Burl, right. Right, right, right. But at one time, you also managed writers and yes, producers yes, yes, and yes. directors. When did that well, come Well, I'll in? tell you, when I actually did all the uh, Playboy clubs, the little Vegas and all the nightclubs and all of that, um, I was really tired of being five feet eight and 115 pounds. Do I eat the radish today on the carrot because the carrot I'm going to get the sugar? Or do I do the celery and I'm going to get the salt from the celery? Five feet eight and I'm a redhead. I'm with the, I, I leave the hairdressers and my roots are coming in already. You know what I mean? You're like, ah. Oh. So I said, you know what? And, and besides, nightclubs started to die out. There were no longer. Oh, right. That's you know, Because then it was Frank, Liza, and Sammy. That, that was what the lineups were. And so, Dean. Yeah, oh, and Dean. I love Dean. I worked with Dean, I love Dean. I knew you wonderful. did, yeah. But uh, so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go in the business end of the business. So I became a personal manager, and I had writers, producers, and directors. I managed their careers, and uh, did very, very- That was a great business, yeah. too. and I could eat. Okay. I could eat more than a celery and a you carrot. You mean really eat? I mean, well, maybe like a half of something. I could eat more than just just looking at it. Yeah, that's great. And then you had this accident. When did the accident oh. come into your life? 
I was leaving my office. I had an office on Beverly Drive. Were you right managing? Street. Yes, what? I was managing. I was with Arnold Sank at the time. He had been a, a, an agent at the Mar William Morris Agency. Okay, and uh, we, you know, I, I was working there and I was crossing the street and I was trying to get my papers out of the car to bring them back because we were doing some negotiations on some things and so forth. And when I was in the crosswalk, an, uh, an epileptic blacked out hit me at the impact of uh, 65 miles an hour. Aww. And I flew up in the air, went head first through his windshield, he dragged me. Anyway, I was a mess. Every right leg, 12 humongous breaks, left leg, back crushed, head ripped open. I was in hospital a long time. I was in and then home, hospital bed for over a year, body in both leg casts. Were, how was your disposition? Were you thinking that you could write now or that you could get back on stage or were you just trying to get well? Well, I had just moved to California. Oh. You know, and I only knew Maury Amsterdam and his wife Kay uh -huh. at the time. And I, and I had started with you know personal management. And I really didn't know anyone. I had a little boy. You know, and his father had died when he was two months old, so I raised him on his mother, father, soul support, oh. sister, brother, everybody to him. We were out here in California. Anyway, and I crossed the street, and that's what happened. So I didn't have time to feel sorry for myself or anything else. I mean, the pain was excruciating. I mean, they were shooting me up with morphine every two, uh, oh my God, every 10 minutes or so. It was just uh, horrible, and I still felt the pain from it because it was bolts and plates in my knee and rods and just awful. Anyway, um, so I didn't have time. I, I had to get us through. I had my son, I had to shore him up to make sure that he he was okay because he could, Mom, look at you. What I you know. know. And he was devastated. Dev little boy. So I just, don't worry, don't worry. I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. But it took me a long time. It took me two, one year in a, a cast, body in both legs, hospital bed. Uh, two years, uh, crutches, walkers, canes, took me three years, five uh, days a week, four hours every day, learning how to walk all over again. How did you keep yourself together? Well, you're a motivational speaker, and I think... Well, now, I mean, for since then, they, that's, that's how that started. I mean. that's, that's how, how that career started. Yeah. Doctors would ask me to come and speak to people who had some accidents or had this or that, the yeah. other thing, because then they'd show my x-rays, the doctors, and the audience would go, the person's dead. Exactly. No, she's a cripple. And she's no. Then I'd come out, and they'd say, "Can't be." I and know. So that was a, that was another career. Yes. This motivational yes. speaking, yes. but that was fantastic because you helped so many people. Well, I tried to, but you know something? No one knows what they're going to be in a situation like that. You think you know, you but you don't. And you, there's two things to do: you sink or you swim. Part of your story, the inspirational part, the exciting part, the, the drama and fashion, all of it is so great. And I think um, when, when people hear this story and they see you on stage, they're going to really appreciate what well, you've done. Well, I'm back done. to do performing, and I do my comedy, I do parodies. That's that what I, do, I mean, yeah. I do nostalgia. That's know? perfect. And it's glamour, it's the feathers, the furs, and the, and it's the songs that we all remember and love. And it's a lot of patter and it's some drama in the middle. Uh, it's not just song after song after song. No, no, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure with yeah, you. Yeah. So I thank you so much for coming well, on thank today. You. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks for watching the show. Email me at jaquinn1 at aol.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. <laughs>